Rocky Side Cheese Tea House. Snow Country, Part 2, by Yasunari Kawabata. Page 24. Shimomura's taste for the Occidental dance had much the same air of unreality about it. He had grown up in the merchant section of Tokyo, and he had been thoroughly familiar with the Kabuki theatre from his childhood. As a student, his interests had shifted to the Japanese dance and the dance drama. Never satisfied until he learned everything about his subject, he'd taken to searching through old documents and visiting the heads of various dance schools. And presently, he had made friends with rising figures in the dance world and was writing what one might call research pieces and critical essays. It was but natural then that he should come to feel a keen dissatisfaction with the slumbering old tradition, as well as with reformers who sought only to please themselves. Just as he had arrived at the conclusion that there was nothing for it but to throw himself actively into the dance movement, and as he was being persuaded to do so by certain of the younger figures in the dance world, he abruptly switched to the Occidental dance. He stopped seeing the Japanese dance. He gathered pictures and descriptions of the Occidental ballet and began laboriously collecting programmes and posters from abroad. This was more than simple fascination with the exotic and the unknown. The pleasure he found in his new hobby came, in fact, from his inability to see, with his own eyes, Occidentals in Occidental ballets. There was proof of this in his deliberate refusal to study the ballet as performed by Japanese. Nothing could be more comfortable than writing about the ballet from books. A ballet he had never seen was an art in another world. It was an unrivalled armchair reverie, a lyric from some paradise. He called his work research, but it was actually free, uncontrolled fantasy. He preferred not to savour the ballet in the flesh. Rather, he savoured the phantasms of his own dancing imagination, called up by Western books and pictures. It was like being in love with someone he'd never seen. But it was also true that Shimomura, with no real occupation, took some satisfaction from the fact that his occasional introductions to the Occidental dance put him on the edge of the literary world, even while he was laughing at himself and his work. It might be said that his knowledge was now for the first time in a very great while being put to use, since talk of the dance helped bring the woman nearer to him, and yet it was also possible that, hardly knowing it, he was treating the woman exactly as he treated the Occidental dance. He felt a little guilty, as though he had deceived her, when he saw how the frivolous words of the traveller, who would be gone tomorrow, seemed to have struck something deep and serious in the woman's life. But he went on, I can bring my family here and we can be friends. I understand that well enough. She smiled, her voice falling, and a touch of the gaseous playfulness came out. I'd like that much better. It lasts longer if you're just friends. You'll call someone then. Now? Now. But what can you say to a woman in broad daylight? At night, there's too much danger of getting the dregs no one else wants. You take this for a cheap hot spring town like any other. I should think you could tell just from looking at the place. Her tone was sober again, as though she felt thoroughly degraded. She repeated with the same emphasis as before that there were no girls here of the sort he wanted. When Shimomura expressed his doubts, she flared up, then retreated a step. It was up to the geisha whether she would stay the night or not. If she stayed without permission from her house, it was her own responsibility. If she had permission, the house took full responsibility, whatever happened. That was the difference. Full responsibility? If there should happen to be a child or some sort of disease. Shimomura smiled wryly at the foolishness of his question. In a mountain village, though, the arrangements between a geisha and her keeper might indeed still be so easy-going. Perhaps with the idlers bent for protective colouring, Shimomura had an instinctive feeling for the spirit of the places he visited, and he had felt as he came down from the mountains that, for all its air of bare frugality, there was something comfortable and easy about the village. He heard at the inn that it was indeed one of the more comfortable villages in this harsh snow country. Until the railway was put through, only very recently, 
it had served mainly as a medicinal spring for farmers in the area. The house that kept geisha would generally have a faded shop curtain that advertised it as a restaurant or a tea room, but a glance at the old style sliding doors, their paper panels dark with age, made the passerby suspect that guests were few. The shop that sold candy or everyday sundries might have its one geisha, and the owner would have his small farm besides the shop and the geisha. Perhaps because she lived with a music teacher, there seemed to be no resentment at the fact that a woman, not yet licensed as a geisha, was now and then helping at parties. How many are there in all? How many geisha? Twelve or thirteen, I suppose. Which one do you recommend? Shimomura stood up to ring for the maid. You won't mind if I leave now? I mind very much indeed. I can't stay. She spoke as if trying to shake off the humiliation. I'm going. It's all right. I don't mind. I'll come again. When the maid came in, however, she sat down as though nothing were amiss. The maid asked several times which geisha she should call, but the woman refused to mention a name. One look at the seventeen or eighteen-year-old geisha who was presently led in, and Shimomura felt his need for a woman fall dully away. Her arms, with their underlying darkness, had not yet filled out, and something about her suggested an unformed, good-natured young girl. Shimomura, at pains not to show that his interest had left him, faced her dutifully, but he could not keep himself from looking less at her than at the new green on the mountains behind her. It seemed almost too much of an effort to talk. She was the mountain geisha through and through. He lapsed into a glum silence. No doubt thinking to be tactful and adroit, the woman stood up and left the room, and the conversation became still heavier. Even so, he managed to pass perhaps an hour with the geisha. Looking for a pretext to be rid of her, he remembered that he had had money telegraphed from Tokyo. He had to go to the post office before it closed he said, and the two of them left the room. But at the door of the inn he was seduced by the mountain, strong with the smell of new leaves. He started climbing roughly up it. He laughed on and on, not knowing himself what was funny. When he was pleasantly tired, he turned sharply around and, tucking the skirts of his kimono into his obi, ran headlong back down the slope. Two yellow butterflies flew up at his feet. The butterflies, weaving in and out, climbed higher than the line of the border range, their yellow turning to white in the distance. What happened? The woman was standing in the shade of the cedar trees. You must have been very happy, the way you were laughing. I gave it up. Shimomura felt the same senseless laugh rising again. I gave it up. Oh? She turned and walked slowly into the grove. Shimomura followed in silence. It was a shrine grove. The woman sat down on a flat rock beside the moss-covered shrine dogs. It's always cool here. Even in the middle of the summer there's a cool wind. Are all the geisha like that? They're all a little like her, I suppose. Some of the older ones are very attractive, if you had wanted one of them. Her eyes were on the ground, and she spoke coldly. The dusky green of the cedars seemed to reflect from her neck. Shimomura looked up at the cedar branches. It's all over. My strength left me, really. It seems very funny. From behind the rock, the cedars threw up their trunks in perfectly straight lines, so high that he could see the tops only by arching his back. The dark needles blocked out the sky, and the stillness seemed to be singing quietly. The trunk against which Shimomura leaned was the oldest of all. For some reason, all the branches on the north side had withered, and their tips broken and fallen. They looked like stakes driven into the trunk with their sharp ends out to make a terrible weapon for some god. I made a mistake. I saw you as soon as I came down from the mountains and I let myself think that all the geisha here were like you. He laughed. It occurred to him now that the thought of washing away in such short order the vigour of seven days in the mountains had perhaps first come to him when he saw the cleanness of this woman. She gazed down at the river, distant in the afternoon sun. Shimomura was a little unsure of himself. I forgot, she suddenly remarked with forced lightness. I brought your tobacco. I went back up to your room a little while ago and found that you had gone out. 
I wondered where you could be, and then I saw you running up the mountain for all you were worth. I watched from the window. You were very funny, but you forgot your tobacco. Here. She took the tobacco from her kimono sleeve and lighted a match for him. I wasn't very nice to that poor girl. But it's up to the guest after all, when he wants to let the geisha go. Through the quiet, the sound of the rocky river came up to them with a rounded softness. Shadows were darkening in the mountain chasms on the other side of the valley, framed in the cedar branches. Unless you were as good as you, I'd feel cheated when I saw you afterwards. Don't talk to me about it. You're just unwilling to admit you lost, that's all. There was scorn in her voice, and yet an affection of quite a new sort flowed between them. As it became clear to Shimamura that he'd, from the start, wanted only this woman, and that he had taken his usual roundabout way of saying so, he began to see himself as rather repulsive, and the woman as all the more beautiful. Something from that cool figure had swept through him after she called to him from under the cedars. The high, thin nose was a little lonely, a little sad, but the bud of her lips opened and closed smoothly, like a beautiful little circle of leeches. Even when she was silent, her lips seemed always to be moving. Had they had wrinkles or cracks, or had their colour been less fresh, they would have struck one as unwholesome, but they were never anything but smooth and shining. The line of her eyelids neither rose nor fell, as if for some special reason it drew its way straight across her face. There was something faintly comical about the effect, but the short, thick hair of her eyebrows sloped gently down to enfold the line discreetly. There was nothing remarkable about the outlines of her round, slightly aquiline face. With her skin like white porcelain coated over a faint pink, and her throat still girlish, not yet filled out, the impression she gave was above all one of cleanness, not quite one of real beauty. Her breasts were rather full for a woman used to the high, binding obi of the geisha. The sandflies have come out, she said, standing up and brushing at the skirt of her kimono. Alone in the quiet, they could think of little to say. It was perhaps ten o'clock that night. The woman called loudly to Shimomura from the hall, and a moment later she fell into his room as if someone had thrown her. She collapsed in front of the table. Flailing with a drunken arm at everything that happened to be on it, she poured herself a glass of water and drank in great gulps. She'd gone out to meet some travellers down from the mountains that evening, men she had been friendly with during the skiing season the winter before. They had invited her to the inn, whereupon they had had a riotous party, complete with geisha, and had proceeded to get her drunk. Her head waved uncertainly, and she seemed prepared to talk on forever. Presently, she remembered herself. I shouldn't be here. I'll come again. They'll be looking for me. I'll come again later. She staggered from the room. An hour or so later, he heard uneven steps coming down the long hall. She was weaving from side to side, he could tell, running into a wall, stumbling to the floor. Shimamura, Shimamura, she called in a high voice. I can't see, Shimamura. It was, with no attempt at covering itself, the naked heart of a woman calling out to her man. Shimamura was startled. That high, piercing voice must surely be echoing all through the inn. He got up hastily. Pushing her fingers through the paper panel, the woman clutched at the frame of the door and fell heavily against him. You're here. Clinging to him, she sank to the floor. She leaned against him as she spoke. I'm not drunk. Who says I'm drunk? Ah, oh, it hurts. It hurts. It's just that it hurts. I know exactly what I'm doing. Give me water. I want water. I mixed my drinks. That was my mistake. That's what goes to your head. It hurts. They had a bottle of cheap whiskey. How was I to know it was cheap? She rubbed her forehead with her fists. The sound of the rain outside was suddenly louder. Each time he relaxed his embrace even a little, she threatened to collapse. His arm was around her neck, so tight that her hair was rumpled against his cheek. He thrust a hand inside the neck of her kimono. He added coaxing words, but she did not answer. She folded her arms like a bar over the breast he was asking for. What's the matter with you? She bit savagely at her arm, as though angered by its refusal to serve her. Damn you! Damn you! Lazy! Useless! What's the matter with you? Shimomura drew back, startled. There were deep teeth marks on her arm. She no longer resisted, however. 
giving herself up to his hands, she began writing something with the tip of her finger. She would tell him the people she liked, she said. After she had written the names of some twenty or thirty actors, she wrote Shimomura, Shimomura, over and over again. The delicious swelling under Shimomura's hand grew warmer. Everything is all right. His voice was serene. Everything is all right again. He sensed something a little motherly in her. But the headache came back. She writhed and twisted and sank to the floor in a corner of the room. It won't do. It won't do. I'm going home. Going home. Do you think you can walk that far and listen to the rain? I'll go home barefoot. I'll crawl home. You don't think that's a little dangerous? If you have to go, I'll take you. The inn was on a hill and the road was a steep one. Suppose you try loosening your clothes. Lie down for a little while and you'll feel well enough to go. No, no, this is the way. I'm used to it. She sat up straight and took a deep breath, but breathing was clearly painful. She felt a little nauseated, she said, and opened the window behind her, but she could not vomit. She seemed to be holding back the urge to fall down, writhing on the floor. Now and then she came to herself. I'm going home, I'm going home, she said again and again, and presently it was after two. Go on to bed, go on to bed when a person tells you to. But what will you do? Shimomura asked. I'll just sit here like this. When I feel a little better, I'll go home. I'll go home before daylight. She crawled over on her knees and tugged at him. Go on to sleep. Pay no attention to me, I tell you. Shimomura went back to bed. The woman sprawled over the table and took another drink of water. Get up. Get up when a person tells you to. Which do you want me to do? All right, go to sleep. You aren't making much sense, you know. He pulled her into bed after him. Her face was turned half away, hidden from him, but after a time she thrust her lips violently toward him. Then, as if in a delirium she were trying to tell of her pain, she repeated over and over, he did not know how many times, No, no, didn't you say you wanted to be friends? The almost too serious tone of it rather dulled his ardour, and as he saw her wrinkle her forehead in the effort to control herself, he thought of standing by the commitment he had made. But then she said, I won't have any regrets. I'll never have any regrets. But I'm not that sort of woman. It can't last. Didn't you say so yourself? She was still half numb from the liquor. It's not my fault. It's yours. You lost. You're, you're the weak one, not I. She ran on almost in a trance and she bit at her sleeve as if to fight back the happiness. She was quiet for a time, apparently drained of feeling. Then... As if the thought came to her from somewhere in her memory, she struck out. You're laughing, aren't you? You're laughing at me. I am not. Deep in your heart, you're laughing at me. Even if you aren't now, you will be later. She was choked with tears. Turning away from him, she buried her face in her hands. But a moment later, she was calm again, soft and yielding as if she were offering herself up. She was suddenly very intimate and she began telling him all about herself. She seemed quite to have forgotten the headache. She said not a word about what had just happened. But I've been so busy talking, I haven't noticed how late it is. She smiled a little bashfully. She had to leave before daylight, she said. It's still dark, but people here get up early. Time after time she got up to look out the window. They won't be able to see my face yet, and it's raining. No one will be going out to the fields this morning. She seemed reluctant to go, even when the lines of the mountain and of the roof on its slopes were floating out of the rain. Finally, it was time for the hotel maids to be up and about. She retouched her hair and ran, almost fled from the room, brushing aside Shimomura's offer to see her to the door. Someone might catch a glimpse of the two of them together. Shimomura went back to Tokyo that day. You remember what you said then, but you were wrong. Why else would anyone come to such a place in December? I wasn't laughing at you. The woman raised her head. Her face, where it had been pressed against Shimomura's hand, was red under the thick powder from the eye across the bridge of the nose. It made him think of the snow country cold, and yet, because of the darkness of her hair, there was a certain warmth in it. She smiled quietly, as though dazzled by a bright light. Perhaps, as she smiled, she thought of then, and Shimomura's words gradually coloured her whole body. When she bowed her head, a little stiffly, he could see that even her back under her kimono was flushed a deep red. 
set off by the colour of her hair, the moist, sensuous skin was as if laid naked before him. Her hair could not really have been called thick, stiff like a man's and swept up into a high Japanese-style coiffure, with not a hair out of place. It glowed like some heavy black stone. Shimomura looked at the hair and wondered whether the coldness that had so startled him, he had never touched such cold hair, he said, might be less the cold of the snow country winter than something in the hair itself. The woman began counting on her fingers. For some time she counted on. What are you counting? he asked. Still the counting continued. It was the 23rd of May. You're counting the days, are you? Don't forget that July and August are two long months in a row. It's the 199th day. It's exactly 199 days. How did you remember it was the 23rd of May? All I have to do is look in my diary. You keep a diary? It's always fun to read an old diary, but I don't hide anything when I write in my diary, and sometimes I'm ashamed to look at it myself. When did you begin? Just before I went to Tokyo as a geisha. I didn't have any money, and I bought a plain notebook for two or three sen and drew in lines. I must have had a very sharp pencil. The lines are all neat and close together, and every page is crammed from top to bottom. When I had enough money to buy a diary, it wasn't the same anymore. I started taking things for granted. It's that way with my writing practice, too. I used to practice on newspapers before I even thought of trying good paper, but now I set it down on good paper from the start. And you've kept the diary all this time? Yes. The year I was 16 and this year have been the best. I write in my diary when I'm home from a party and ready for bed, and when I read it over I can see places where I've gone to sleep writing. But I don't write every day. Some days I miss. Way off here in the mountains, every party's the same. This year I couldn't find anything except a diary with a new day on each page. It was a mistake. When I start writing, I want to write on and on. But even more than at the diary, Shimomura was surprised at her statement that she had carefully catalogued every novel and short story she had read since she was 15 or 16. The record already filled 10 notebooks. You write down your criticisms, do you? I could never do anything like that. I just write down the author and the characters and how they are related to each other. That's about all. But what good does it do? None at all. A waste of effort. A complete waste of effort, she answered brightly, as though the admission meant little to her. She gazed solemnly at Shimura, however. A complete waste of effort. For some reason, Shimomura wanted to stress the point. But, drawn to her that moment, he felt a quiet like the voice of the rain flow over him. He knew well enough that for her it was in fact no waste of effort. But somehow, the final determination that it was had the effect of distilling and purifying the woman's existence. Her talk of novels seemed to have little to do with literature in the everyday sense of the word. The only friendly ties she had with the people of this village had come from exchanging women's magazines, and afterwards she'd gone on with her reading by herself. She was quite indiscriminate and had little understanding of literature, and she borrowed even the novels and magazines she found lying in the guests' rooms at the inn. Not a few of the new novelists whose names came to her meant nothing to Shimomura. Her manner was as though she were talking of a distant foreign literature. There was something lonely, something sad in it, something that rather suggested a beggar who has lost all desire. It occurred to Shimomura that his own distant fantasy on the Occidental Ballet, built up from words and photographs in foreign books, was not in its way dissimilar. She talked on happily too of movies and plays she had never seen. She had no doubt been starved all these months for someone who would listen to her. Had she forgotten that 199 days earlier, exactly this sort of conversation had set off the impulse to throw herself at Shimomura. Again she lost herself in the talk, and again her words seemed to be warming her whole body. But her longing for the city had become an undemanding dream, wrapped in simple resignation, and the note of wasted effort was much stronger in it than in any suggestion of the exile's lofty dissatisfaction. She did not seem to find herself especially sad, but in Shimomura's eyes there was something strangely touching about her. Were he to give himself quite up to that consciousness of wasted effort, Shimomura felt, he would be drawn into a remote emotionalism that would make his own life a waste. But before him was the quick, live face of the woman, ruddy from the mountain air. In any case, he had revised his view of her, and he had found, surprisingly, 
that her being a geisha made it even more difficult for him to be free and open with her. Dead drunk that night, she had savagely bitten her half-paralysed arm in a fit of irritation at its recalcitrance. What's the matter with you? Damn you! Damn you! Lazy! Worthless! What's the matter with you? And, unable to stand, she had rolled from side to side. I'll never have any regrets, but I'm not that sort of woman. I'm not that sort of woman. The Midnight for Tokyo The woman seemed to sense his hesitation, and she spoke as if to push it away. At the sound of the train whistle, she stood up. Roughly throwing open a paper panelled door and the window behind it, she sat down on the sill with her body thrown back against the railing. The train moved off into the distance, its echo fading into a sound as of the night wind. Cold air flooded the room. Have you lost your mind? Shimamura too went over to the window. The air was still, without a suggestion of wind. It was a stern night landscape. The sound of the freezing of snow over the land seemed to roar deep into the earth. There was no moon. The stars, almost too many of them to be true, came forward so brightly that it was as if they were falling with the swiftness of the void. As the stars came nearer, the sky retreated deeper and deeper into the night colour. The layers of the border range, indistinguishable one from another, cast their heaviness at the skirt of the starry sky, in a blackness grave and sombre enough to communicate their mass. The whole of the night scene came together in a clear, tranquil harmony. As she sensed Shimamura's approach, the woman fell over with her breast against the railing. There was no hint of weakness in the pose. Rather, against the night, it was the strongest and most stubborn she could have taken. So we have to go through that again, thought Shimamura. Black though the mountains were, they seemed at that moment brilliant with the colour of the snow. They seemed to him somehow transparent, somehow lonely. The harmony between sky and mountains was lost. Shimamura put his hand to the woman's throat. You'll catch cold. See how cold it is. He tried to pull her back, but she clung to the railing. I'm going home. Her voice was choked. Go home then. Let me stay th like this a little longer. I'm going down for a bath. No, stay here with me. If you close the window. Let me stay here like this a little longer. Half the village was hidden behind the cedars of the shrine grove. The light in the railway station, not ten minutes away by taxi, flickered on and off as if crackling in the cold. The woman's hair, the glass of the window, the sleeve of his kimono. Everything he touched was cold in a way Shimamura had never known before. Even the straw mats under his feet seemed cold. He started down to the bath. Wait, I'll go with you. The woman followed meekly. As she was rearranging the clothes he'd thrown to the floor outside the bath, Another guest, a man, came in. The woman crouched low in front of Shimamura and hid her face. Excuse me, the other guest started to back away. No, please, Shimamura said quickly. We'll go next door. He scooped up his clothes and stepped over to the women's bath. The woman followed as if they were married. Shimamura plunged into the bath without looking back at her. He felt a high laugh mount to his lips now that he knew she was with him. He put his face to the hot water tap and noisily rinsed his mouth. Back in the room, she raised her head a little from the pillow and pushed her side hair up with her little finger. This makes me very sad. She said only that. Shimamura thought for a moment that her eyes were half open, but he saw that the thick eyelashes created the illusion. The woman, always high strung, did not sleep the whole night. It was apparently the sound of the obi being tied that awakened Shimamura. I'm sorry, I should have let you sleep. It's still dark. Look, can you see me? She turned off the light. Can you see me? You can't. I can't see you. It's still pitch dark. No, no, I want you to look close. Now, can you see me? She threw open the window. It's no good. You can see me. I'm going. Surprised anew at the morning cold, Shimamura raised his head from the pillow. The sky was still the colour of night, but in the mountains it was already morning. But it's all right. The farmers aren't busy this time of the year, and no one will be out so early. But do you suppose someone might be going out into the mountains? She talked on to herself, and she walked about, trailing the end of the half-tied obi. There were no guests on the five o'clock from Tokyo. None of the inn people will be up for a long while yet. Even when she had finished tying the obby, she stood up and sat down, and stood up again, 
and wandered about the room with her eye on the window. She seemed on edge like some restless night beast that fears the approach of the morning. It was as though a strange, magical wildness had taken her. Presently, the room was so light that he could see the red of her cheeks. His eye was fastened on that extraordinarily bright red. Your cheeks are flaming. That's how cold it is. It's not from the cold. It's because I've taken off my powder. I only have to get into bed and in a minute I'm warm as an oven, all the way to my feet. She knelt at the mirror by the bed. It's daylight. I'm going home. Shimamura glanced up at her and immediately lowered his head. The white in the depths of the mirror was as snow, and floating in the middle of it were the woman's bright red cheeks. There was an indescribably fresh beauty in the contrast. Was the sun already up? The brightness of the snow was more intense. It seemed to be burning icily. Against it, the woman's hair became a clearer black, touched with a purple sheen. Wagisashi's Tea House. Please subscribe.